Hello and welcome to all of you. You're watching Tech24. I'm Julia Seeger. In this edition, from Mexico to Ghana, we tell you how companies and even individuals are now using drones to help overcome the lack of infrastructure. This as they battle COVID-19. And in Test24, Dan and Jay Cattlecar is set to tell you how you can deepen your understanding of the cosmos thanks to remote astronomy. In Mexico, a tech enthusiast is bringing together voluntary drone pilots on a mission. They've been flying their aircrafts to disinfect public places and inform the population, but also to deliver essential medical equipment. They've been crisscrossing the country for weeks now, flying their devices wherever they're needed the most. Our correspondents Laurence Cuvillier and Mathieu Comin have this report from Tepeo Juama in Mexico's Puebla state. They come in all sizes. Luis Alfonso and his team of volunteers are working on their latest mission. Alert the local population about sanitation measures, disinfect the town square, and deliver masks to the most remote residents. The peripheral, you're going to put it at 20, 25 meters, okay? And just circle over the whole village. Okay, let's do it. These are the drones fighting COVID. This 37-year-old entrepreneur had been using them to monitor crops for years, and he only had to adapt them slightly for this new context. I launched this initiative, and in just a few hours, a few days, I had an amazing response. More than 300 drone pilots volunteered. It's often the municipal authorities which seek out the help of this tiny flying armada. At first, we figured municipalities could cover the cost of this, but we also understand how tight budgets are right now because of the crisis. This unconventional entrepreneur decided to barter for his services. In exchange for launching his drones, he asks for local handicrafts, which he'll sell when the crisis passes. Here in Tepeohuma, there's only been one confirmed case of COVID-19 but the country has yet to reach the most aggressive phase of the pandemic. In our city, the majority of residents are elderly because so many of the young people migrate to the United States. So our people are the most vulnerable to the virus. Vulnerable and isolated. In this vast and mountainous landscape, entire communities exist without a local clinic. But with the simple hook available on open source, drones can deliver aid packages weighing up to five kilos filled with masks and medication as far as five kilometers away. 3D printing this hook costs us just five euros, and we can mount it on any commercial drone and deliver medicine. Barter open source mutual aid, Luis Alfonso is an idealist. He and his team of volunteers have already flown 5,000 kilometers against the virus, and they don't plan on landing anytime soon. And joining me now on Tech24 is our tech expert, Dan and Jake Hadelkar. Hello, Dan. Hi, Julia. So in Ghana, drones are also being used this time to ascend and deliver COVID-19 test samples to laboratories. That's right. The company Zipline is using drones to deliver COVID-19 test samples from rural healthcare centers in Ghana to big cities like Accra and Kumasi, where they can be analyzed in medical laboratories. The first of these deliveries took place on April 17, when a batch of 51 samples was transported from Zipline's distribution center at Omenako to Accra, covering a distance of 68 kilometers. Now, this method saves both time and money and can help authorities to respond in a more efficient manner. This can also help improve the testing percentage. And as experts have said, testing is one of the key elements in containing the spread of this disease. In the UK, a trial involving the delivery of medical supplies by drones will be held soon. The Windracers UAV, a double-engine fixed-wing aircraft, will be carrying 40 kilograms of medical supplies from Southampton to St. Mary's Hospital on the Isle of Wight in just 20 minutes. Back to you, Julia. 
Well, thank you very much, Dan and Jay Cattle Car there. And we're gonna move on to a whole other story. An asteroid dubbed 1998-OR2 came within 3.9 million miles of the Earth, prompting scientists to qualify it as a near-Earth object. This also raised questions about potential future collisions. Well, to speak more about it, I'm joined by Athena Brunsberger. She's a science communicator specializing in astrophysics. It's truly a pleasure to have you on the show, Athena. Hey, Julia, thanks for having me. So tell us more about what scientists actually discovered during the flyby of this space rock. Um, so astronomers were able to determine that its trajectory and its speed um, did come in at an accuracy of just around 6 million kilometers um, from the Earth's surface. And it is so cool. It's actually going to be coming back around um, in 2079. So we've got quite a long ways ahead of us. But when it does come back around, it's going to be about three and a half times closer to Earth than it was this time around. So I'm really excited to see um, what more is going to be coming out when it comes back around. Now, something to keep in mind is there are quite a lot of asteroids within our solar system, and that's because located between Mars and Jupiter is a belt, an asteroid belt. So there's tons of space rocks in there. And every now and then, Jupiter, because of its gravity, it can slingshot an asteroid and throw it off of its gravitational effect within that orbit, and it could swing and come towards the inner solar system, hence passing by Earth, just like this asteroid 1998 OR2 did. So Athena, how frequent is it that an asteroid comes near Earth like that, and would we actually be prepared if an asteroid were to come straight at us? It is really important that space agencies have missions and plans um, for in case there is an expected asteroid impact. Um, so this is going, um, for instance, looking at NASA has their own mission, OSMA, which is focused on planetary protection. So um, they can actually do certain divisions where they're able to track specific asteroids, its trajectory. We've even been able to land um, missions on a comet before, which is really, really awesome. And now that's different. That is for collecting elements for like, for instance, asteroid mining, comet mining, um, to actually like find ways to repurpose elements of these space rocks. But that being said, it is highly possible to also land a mission with say an engine attached to it to be able to redirect an asteroid onto another trajectory to push it out of its orbit if it's coming towards Earth, if detected soon enough. So. That is something to keep in mind, why it's very important for the entire planet in itself to actually have these types of missions planned. Athena Brunsberger, thank you very much indeed for that. It was truly a pleasure. All right, bye, Julia. Thanks so much for having me. And it's time now for Test 24. Dan and Jake Cattle Car is about to tell you how you can deepen your understanding of the cosmos with remote astronomy. Well, Julia, for the past few years, I have been using the telescope behind me to observe the night sky. But today I got a chance to use a much bigger state-of-the-art telescope, not from my backyard, but which is located thousands of kilometers away from here in California. This is thanks to itelescope.net, an organization that has developed a network of 18 internet controlled telescopes spread across the world in both the northern and the southern hemispheres. The only requirements to use these telescopes are a web browser and a membership account with itelescope.net. Now this is fairly straightforward. Once you enter the website, you get a catalog of the best visible celestial objects on that particular date. For today, I chose the Pinwheel Galaxy primarily because it is one of the most spectacular objects visible in the night sky through a telescope. This galaxy is 21 million light years away from the Earth and it is spread across 170,000 light years, making it almost twice the size as our own Milky Way galaxy. This galaxy was discovered in 1781 by the French astronomer Pierre Mecha. Now, once you have decided upon the object, next to it is a link called telescopius.com where there is a telescope simulator. Now, this simulator helps you to understand how an object will look through different telescopes. Now for this session, I have chosen the T24 telescope, which is a 24 and a half inch instrument located at the Sierra Remote Observatory in California. 
Once you have decided upon the telescope, you can go to the dedicated web page of the telescope and there obtain the coordinates of the object you want to observe and click pictures. Once that is done, the telescope aligns itself to that object at a set time for a set duration. Now, in my case, I chose a duration of 20 minutes uh, for the astrophotography session. And in fact, even as I speak, I have started to get images. And this is the first black and white image of the M101 galaxy. And needless to say, I'm absolutely thrilled because this is my first astrophotography session. You can also get colored images by using a special image processing software. Now, this facility, itelescope.net, has been used not only for astrophotography sessions, but also for research purposes. In fact, some of the near-Earth objects and even exoplanets have been discovered using these telescopes. Back to you, Julia. And that actually brings us to the end of this week's edition of Tech 24. This week we're also celebrating the 30th anniversary of the Hubble telescope. And we're going to leave you with some of the most impressive pictures it took in the last few years. See you soon on Tech 24.